Hey everyone, this is Luke from BaseGorilla.com and today I'm here with Slink. His real name is Evan. Evan, how's it going, mate? Pretty good, mate. How are you, Luke? I'm doing well, man. <laughs> so basically, what's going to happen is Slink's going to talk about some general stuff, first of all. You know, his equipment setup, influences, things like that. And then we're going to get more in depth and he's actually going to walk you through one of the tracks that he made off his album, Front Yard Futon. So the track is called Inside. And we're going to get in depth with that, and you'll be able to see inside his Ableton project as he explains that. So, cool. with all that said, um, Evan, let's talk first of all about um, who you are. For anyone that doesn't have any idea who Slink is, what are you all about, and what kind of music do you make? Well, um, I'm from Australia. I'm living in Vancouver now, and uh, I've been producing uh, for about 10 years now, maybe even longer than that actually. And uh, I've been a DJ for roughly the same time and uh, moved to Canada about two and a half years ago. And I started out making drum and bass actually, a lot of people don't know that. I wanted to be a, a drum and bass DJ and producer. Um, same but as me. What's that? Same as me, man. I used to make drum and bass. That was yeah. pretty much all I made before. It's good fun. Um, and then I, I got into a little bit of hip hop production as well. And, and um, then I had my first gig and it was at a cafe. So you can't play drum and bass at a cafe. <laughs> so <laughs> I got into um, into funk and hip hop and stuff, which is, uh, which, which is more what I'm known for now. Um, the, the remixed kind of mashup funk and and then moving on to later on in my career more of the glitch hop kind of sound so funky glitch hop i guess yeah right awesome and so for anyone that doesn't know that style of music who are some of the similar artists that they may have heard of before oh you you've definitely heard of um a skills feature cast sticky buds um even uh, loosely like crafty cuts although he's mostly known for his breaks but he does a little bit of funky glitch up here and there um, nice yeah those, those those kind of guys so yeah yeah awesome all right so let's talk about your setup like what workstation do you use what uh monitors do you use and things like that so i use uh ableton um live obviously and um i have here i'll show you i've got these um PM2, these Fostex PM2 MK2s and um, they're pretty nice. They're just powered speakers and the really cool thing I like about them is it has a tweeter gain so you can adjust how much treble is coming out of the top speaker um, and the bass comes out of the bottom speaker. So through my experience what I actually figured out is if I'm rendering tracks down and then realize that there's not enough uh, treble then I just turn the treble down on my speakers to force me to add more um, but I seriously recommend these speakers they're they're pretty decent excellent um, but aside from that I just have a little um, Korg uh, I'll just show you this it's just a little Korg micro key MIDI keyboard it's three octaves no bells and whistles just um, octave up and down and pitch and mod wheel and that's it, and I produce you... on a PC, so yeah. Okay, and do you actually have a talk box as well? I do. <laughs> I'm not, not sure if I can show you, but it's a, it's an MXR talk box. Um, let me see if I can just get the camera to look at it. Yeah, MXR talk box. So the tube goes in there, and then there's a few uh, knobs to change the kind of sound um, that comes out of the out of the tube is slight distortion volume and a tone which is kind of acts like a eq really so, awesome yeah well any of you guys watching this can check out some of the videos on slink's youtube channel he's actually got i, I saw one video where you're using that talk box so that was really yeah. cool i've actually um i want to get better at the talk box so my way of doing that is to uh, do a TalkBox video every Tuesday, hashtag TalkBox Tuesday, <laughs> uh, on my Facebook page. So uh, if you want to watch me um, and come along with on the journey, f you know, with me getting better at the TalkBox and, and check out my fan page. Awesome. Yeah. We'll see how good you are by the end of 2016. We'll see. Hopefully uh, <laughs> I can get good enough to play live. That'll be really fun. 
Nice. All right. So let's talk about some of your soft synths and VSTs and things like that. Do you have any kind of go-to soft synths or audio effects plugins that you like to use? Uh, as far as like synths go, um, obviously Massive has been a, a big one for me. I always find myself using Massive um, in one part of the project or another. Um, recently, Serum has been a, a good go-to um, for like those high kind of chord sounds and, and even some bass sounds. It's really versatile. It's basically like Massive, but it's kind of been taken to the next level, you know. Um, but aside from that, uh, I've experimented with a few others, but I think those two would be my staples. Do you use uh, Ableton Operator as well? Uh, very rarely. Um, right. Yeah. O occasionally, like, um, if I want to make a sub sound, or, or I've used it to make a neuro bass sound before, um, but I don't use it that much. Right. Yeah. Okay, and so for any of you guys who know Sphinx Music, you'll know that it has a lot of uh, real instruments in it as well as digital sounds. So I wanted to ask you, Slink, about that. So in terms of samples, do you typically get musicians to actually play things for you or do you um, use loops from sample packs or what do you do there? I'd say it's about half and half. <clears throat> um, I definitely have a, a large library of, you know, funky guitars and, and horn samples and stuff like that. Um, but I've been trying to get more and more actual musicians to play on some of my tracks. And I think it's just more just because um, these days I know more musicians than I used to. Um, so, like, for example, Father Funk has been playing lots of guitars for me recently. Um, my housemate upstairs, uh, his name's Cole, he plays for the Funk Hunters sometimes. And he's done a little bit of uh, trumpet for me, which is really nice. He's very talented. A um, couple other guys down in Portland, um, Afro Cuban and Max Ribner, have been playing some guitars and horns for me. So I'm trying to get more and more um, actual musicians involved in my tracks. But um, usually what I tend to do is, as I'm coming up with the track, I'll just try and find a couple of samples on, within my library to sort of use as a placeholder. Um, and then, you know, further down the track, I'll actually get someone to record something, which is obviously a lot better than the sample. So do you normally, for example, those guys in Portland, would you travel down to Portland and record with them or do they just record and send you the files? Uh, when I wrote um, Front Yard Futon with Max Ribner and, and Afri Cuban, uh, we just actually jumped on a Skype call together and I was like sort of you know, directing the the recording session a little bit from my end. Um, yeah. But mostly I left it up to just their own sort of artistic um, interpretation of what I wanted. And yeah. I, actually, I actually find a big part of getting the most out of your musicians is just directing them the right way. Like, I want something like this. I want a little bit of that, you know. And and I've, I've been getting um, better at telling these musicians exactly what I'm after. Yeah, that must be a skill in itself, kind of communicating your yeah. vision of melodies and... It is, because, you know, as a music producer, you can hear something in your head and you just, you have to verbalize it in a way that um, an actual musician can understand, um, whether it be, you know, uh, telling them what key the song is in and, and what kind of tempo and rhythm you want. So, lots of emails and, and Skype sessions, basically. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Well, that actually brings me to the next point, because if you listen to Slink's music, guys, then you might notice that it's very, very melodic, very musical, especially compared to some other styles of electronic music that might be a lot more kind of rhythm focused and less, less going on with the melodies and the hooks. So I wanted to ask you, Evan, how important is music theory knowledge for producing your style of music? Oh, it's very important, I think. Um, I think... A lot of people that are new producers um, go into writing music and, and really focus on the sound design aspect of it. And what they don't realize is you can use a really simple sound and if the notes um, and melodies and, and chord progressions and everything like that um, really work, then the sounds, um, you know, like 
you, you got to balance those two things, you know. You've got to have a nice sound, obviously, but I think the notes are much more important. And that's why you hear some songs that just jump out at you, um, but they don't really seem to have that crazy of a sound design aspect to them. So I think it's really important. And uh, I'm not going to pretend like I'm the best at, um, put, you know, writing chord progressions and melodies and stuff like that, but it's definitely something that I've put a lot of effort into and tried to focus on as I've been, you know, traveling through my career as a music producer. So if somebody is listening to this and they're really passionate about making music, but they don't really have any understanding about music theory, what kind of things should they be trying to learn and figure out first as a beginner? Um, I think it would be, that's a really hard question. Um, I think mm. you just have to learn what notes are in, you know, what keys. So if you press a key on the keyboard, say a, a G, um, and you wanted to play a G minor scale, you, you should really learn all the notes that are in that scale because any one of those notes is going to be a note that's going to work within the song if you choose that scale. Um, and it's when you start choosing notes that are out of that scale where things get either really cool and interesting and jazzy or just terribly, horribly wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think a good way to start learning um, about music theory, and it's kind of crude, but this is kind of what I did, is is just listen to songs and then try and, and play them and figure out what notes those songs are using. Um, and you'll kind of train your ear to to learn what's what sounds right and what sounds wrong. And that's very subjective, but I think just using, yeah, other, other people's songs as, as reference and uh, figuring out the melodies and chord progressions and stuff like that. Nice. Okay, so let's move on. Let's talk a bit about workflow. So we're going to get into the track insides in a, in a little bit, but when it comes to workflow, do you have a set approach that you usually take when you're trying to make a new tune? Like, do you normally start with the drums get those down first and then just kind of jam over them to come out with some kind of hooks and melodies or what do you do there? Uh, I never, like, I, how do I say this? I think um, the better way to approach writing a song is not to sit down with a blank project and start writing a song. Um, I think a better way is actually to sit down and go, okay, I'm going to write drums today. The next day, okay, I'm going to design a a bass patch. Uh, the day after that, okay, I'm going to write a chord progression. And then usually what happens with me is I'll hear a song and, and or I'll find a sample that really inspires me. And, and then I just go into um, crazy uh, snowball mode where I'm like, oh, I wonder what that would sound like with some drums on it. And I just drag some drums in that I made earlier. And then, oh, maybe what 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 kind of bass sound will work on this? And I drag some basses in that I've made previously. And then things just start happening very quickly. And I think that's important to keep the momentum up of, of your inspiration. Because once you lose that inspiration, then you're just listening to the same loop over and over and you're not really progressing. So I would say like I tend to start with either the drums or uh, an interesting sample that I've found and then build off of that. But I think it's good to, a good practice um, is to just have a ton of different uh, resources at your disposal that you can quickly drag in when inspiration hits. Yeah, it's kind of like if you want to bake the most delicious cake, then make no mistake that if you want to <laughs> make it great, you should have all the ingredients on the table in That's front right. of you. That's yeah, right. So you're just ready to do it. Absolutely. That was a terrible analogy. But <laughs> I thought it was amazing. <laughs> I love it how you rhymed it as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, doing, we're talking about music, you know, just bust out some rhymes just whenever Freestyle I can. Bro. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay. So um, one thing I wanted to ask you about before we take a look in, at the inside of Inside is um, have you noticed that as you became more and more well known in the scene, did you start to get a lot more people sending you their own music, asking you for feedback? Yes. Okay. That, that happens to me a lot. Um, and <laughs> I, I try to um, listen to everything and reply to people, but um, it gets a bit overwhelming with the number of tracks I'm getting sent. Um, but 
um, it's cool because people that are you know, in the same scene as me, we all kind of send our songs to each other for feedback. Um, and, you know, I try to give feedback and I hopefully can get other people to give me feedback on my songs. But I think yeah. it's it's really, it's a good thing, man. Like, uh, when you've just worked all day on a song, all you want to do is show someone. Um, but, you know, it's not quite done yet, so you can't just go ahead and release it. Um, so, it's good to have, like, a few friends that are in into producing that you can sort of bounce ideas off of every now and then for right. sure. Yeah. Well, what I wanted to ask you about when it comes to that topic, the reason why I asked it is um, yeah. when people are in their first say like year or two or maybe even three years of producing and they send you tracks, do you notice any similarities with the kind of mistakes that people are making or things that they, do you have any advice for them on things they should change the direction or focus on absolutely <laughs> <laughs> i hear the same mistakes time and time again i think the number one mistake that um, really exposes you as a newbie producer is not learning how to utilize the warping algorithms of ableton correctly um, too many times i've heard people just dragging a sample its default set setting is is beats mode and you can yeah. hear the, the time stretching uh, artifacts or errors in there so clearly but to the untrained ear it's it's very um, hard to pick up on that yeah um, or uh, on the flip side people just drag in songs they've learnt that beats mode's no good so they just choose complex and it sounds real muddy and the high end is all uh, kind of the crispiness of all the sounds have just been dulled. So I think it's really important to spend a lot of time um, reading about how to use the algorithms properly and experimenting with different um, different algorithms on different sounds. You know, obviously beats mode works better on beats. Um, right. So long as you set up the transients right and stuff like that. So that's a, that's a big one. I constantly hear stuff in the Juno uh, download um, top charts that just have time stretching artifacts all over it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, it's pretty bad. Uh, the other thing is um, probably just bad notes. They haven't really spent enough time, you know, we were talking about it earlier. They haven't spent enough time learning musical theory and they're kind of just randomly plucking um, notes on their MIDI keyboard and it just sounds really disjointed and and nothing seems to flow. Yeah. Um, so that's probably my second criticism for <clears throat> newbie producers. And I'd say the third one would be um, not learning about the groove pool in Ableton and just writing straight straight beats. If you're trying to write something like Funky Glitch Hop or Glitch Hop in general or really any song, um, depending on your style, uh, nine times out of ten it's going to sound better with a bit of a swung beat. You know, every second and and fourth note is a bit late um, to give you to give that groove. But too many times I hear drums that you know sound like a robot has made it. Some, I mean, don't get me wrong. Sometimes you're going for a robot feel, <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, if you're craft work or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, a lot of these guys that send me their songs um, are inspired by me, and they're trying to write funky glitch chop, and they just don't know how to use the groove pool and how to add swing to their beats so those are probably the top three things excellent awesome so let's take a look inside inside all and right i'll just flip over to ableton cool so what should we do to begin with should we play a little bit of it and give people a feel for it yeah if you want to i'll just how about i just skip to the to the drop <laughs> don't yeah. don't bore us get to the chorus <laughs> Oh, 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 
yeah, you can hear the whole thing on um, SoundCloud. If you go to my SoundCloud, you can check it out. Yeah. Um, but that's just a little taste. So when I listen to that, I hear so much going on. I hear um, different textures and, and tones within the bass line. I hear a really overriding, great, powerful hook for the lead. And I hear yeah. all these little background sounds going on. So would you be able to talk a little bit about the arrangement and your thought process when it comes to creating, say, like a four-bar loop or a, an eight-bar loop and just filling it out and making it sound full and finished? Um, my process behind that, um, I, I guess I try to just leave um, room for every sound to shine through. And, and if you kind of put sounds um, one after another, then you get, um, uh, and all the sounds are very different, then you get a very interesting, crazy kind of sounding bass line like that. Like I'll just solo this for a second. So I'm zoomed in and, and you can see all the different bass sounds separately. Uh, this is going to be interesting because you can't actually see what I'm doing. Hey, Luke. <laughs> yeah. I love um, it. I'm blindfolded. Blindfolded. Um, so I, I tend to utilize like a little bit of panning. So some sounds are on the left, some sounds are on the right, um, some are in between, um, filters and whatnot. Um, but I mean, it's hard to describe what the process is. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a lot of just trial and error, really. Um, does that work here? No. Does that work there? Yes. Um, but how I come up, how I come up with these sounds is uh, all these sounds that I, you know, have used is I'll just like hit record on a synthesizer with the beat going and just uh, tap away at the keyboard while I'm changing settings um, and record like maybe half an hour of, of sounds and then I'll go through and preview all the sounds and chop out the ones that I like and delete the ones I don't like and then just jump right in and start arranging them just put this one here how does that sound how do i want to start it um and yeah like that's that's really the most fun you can have with with making um glitch up music it's it's really fun experimenting with uh the different placements of all the sounds and you know you're just limitless with options you can spend days on a four bar loop and yeah have it super intricate um but i think um having some sort of slight repetition in the baseline you can see or well, you can't see luke but i try to have a, a similar sound um at the start or you know try and somewhat loop it so that people on the dance floor are not completely lost um and it that way it makes it a bit more catchy you know I remember this. I heard this four bars ago, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? So for you, is it that in this song, is it the lead synth that you say would be that that hook? Or is it the bass line that you're talking about? Yeah, the, the hook is this sound here. I'd say um, I actually have it labeled as hook in the project, by the way, Luke. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, I did consider it a hook, um, but it's more in the sense of like, it's a melody that will kind of get stuck in your head. Um, mm -hmm. cause I, I wanted to write my, my philosophy with this song was I wanted to write something that was going to be danceable and very high emotions and high energy with a very memorable kind of melody that will, that you just get stuck in your head, you know? So, um, it's kind of funny that the way I went about writing this melody is believe it or not listening to some taylor swift <laughs> hell yeah <laughs> my favorite artist and uh uh what's that song shake it up shake it up when the players went a na 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 it's something like that right and i kind of took some inspiration from that after i realized that the notes really don't they really don't um, sort of imply a chord progression. It's like, so it's almost like you can put any chord progression under the melody that she's singing, you know, within the realm of that same kind of key. But 
Um, so that's kind of like my concept for for this melody is just to have a melody that doesn't imply a chord progression, and yeah. and that way I can change the energy of the of the song but she's changing the chord progression. So like, for example, if we listen to the first drop. Right, you can hear the chord progression in the background. And then the second drop. So it's kind of like a progression um, of the previous chord progression. Mm -hmm. um, like an evolution of it, rather. It's a progression of a progression. More of an yeah, evolution. It's in session. <laughs> oh, <Yeah>. snap. <laughs> hey, so I wanted to ask you about that. In that second drop that you just played now, did it have yep. the notes of the bass line? Were they changed or were they exactly the same? Abs absolutely. The notes are different. So um, I'm just uh, zooming in on the piano roll here. And if you take a look, we've got... A, D, E, and then F in the first drop. And then on the second drop, we've got A, C, C sharp, D, F. So it's a little bit different. Um, it kind of goes lower. And then I wrote some chords to, um, to go underneath that. I'm not um, a nerdy chord guy that can name these chords, but... <laughs> So that they're a little bit, they're definitely a little bit di different. And I think, you know, the philosophy again, like having the hook that that stays relatively the same um, while you change the chord progression underneath is is really interesting. Changes yeah. the energy. So in addition to the bass line, is there anything else contributing to the chords? Is there some pads or something that you can solo? Yeah. Um, so I, I wrote these um, in... Massive, actually. I thought I did these in Serum, but I think I wrote this before Serum came out. So this is the build-up. Um. So that's the first drop. And then there's a an alternating kind of progression here to give it it's even more movement and energy changing. Yeah. And then the second drop would be... And then that second part is the same. Um, but uh, another thing with the chords is they kind of um, they kind of revolve. Like the last chord kind of leads into the very first chord, <clears throat> and all the chords in between kind of tie those two chords together. And and the last chord is more of a tension building chord. Like that just implies like some kind of re you know resolution you know it's like bah, something's gonna happen suspense and then and then you're back to the start again so I tried to make my chord progression um, you know revolve in a in a circle yeah so it always goes back to the root yeah chord which kind of keeps making, it makes you want to listen on you know, like, yeah. What's the next chord? Ah, it's that it one at the start. The next one. Yeah. yeah. So, and uh, I wanted to ask you about those chords because it sounds like there's some pitch wobble going on, like some tremolo or something. Is that happening on all of those chords or just some of them? Um, if I show you, well, not you, but the watchers, <laughs> the viewers, <laughs> uh, you can see I do have a vibrato um, automation happening here on the last chord. Now I know how Stevie Wonder felt all the time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, but yeah, there's a, there's a vibrato 
um, on the last chord. So that last one. So it's like... Bang, and right. Then, yeah. It's just, you know, to give it some funk. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, and it also builds a bit of tension, I think, leading into the the yeah. uh, loop. And it's like the classic disco sound, you know, like the the vibrato chord. So it's kind of like a little nod to disco music in general. And if anyone's wondering what this is, this is the automation of the reverb turning on and off, which kind of gives it that breathy stop start sound. Like you can see between uh, this chord and this chord, there's a there's a, almost a breath. Yeah. And then it stops because I have the automation saying that uh, the reverb should just turn off there. So there's a little bit of automation, not too much, just the vibrato and, and the um, uh, filter and the reverb turning on and off. I think that's about all I... Oh, no, there's some other stuff. Well, <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that all the other stuff is more for the build-ups and whatever. Um, so I wanted yeah. to ask you about, like, I understand that there's the bass line, there's the lead synth playing the hook, and then there's the chords. And, of course, there's drums, but... Is there anything else going on, like little background sounds or glitchy sounds to add to the ambiance? Um, I think I stole a impact sound from a random sample pack here. Yeah. It's just a tiny clap sound that's just like... Um, I've got some guitars down here, apparently. I, I can't remember. I wrote this song a while ago. Yeah. Little twangs and... So that's hidden in the back just to like add to the rhythm, I suppose. Yeah. Um, what else do we have? Um, there's a little flute loop that I took from a sample pack. Mm. It's very subtle. More of a pan pipe, actually. Nice. Um, but the, amb the ambiance, as you say, um, mm. kind of more comes from you know, turning reverb on and off and stuff like that in the bass line. Like that last sound there, especially. Yeah. It's got a load of reverb on it and there's, there's a lot of uh, automation happening here where I'm turning the verb on and off, um, panning things left and right. Um, adding stereo wideness, taking stereo wideness away, um, and filters, I think there's a little, oh no, the filter's just for the, um, no, that filter doesn't have any automation on it, never mind. Um, yeah, so just a little, little bit of variances in the, in the sounds makes it interesting. Nice. So one other thing that really struck me about the track is that the drums are so punchy and powerful, and the kick and the snare sound so well matched together like they're from the same kit or whatever so yeah just wanted to ask how did you get those the kick and snare to just sound so amazing um i don't know let's have a listen so those are the kicks i forget what i've done here actually it's been a while um it looks like i've taken a sample from whatever pack there and then added on the snare, um, a huge, a huge boost to um, the 200 hertz range. Yeah. Um, and then, sort of higher up on the the very high end, I've I've given it a bit of a boost as well. Um, and then a slight reverb, uh, which is very quiet in the background. And then a glue compressor, which is jacked way up to to increase the transient of that snap on the snare drum. Okay. Um, so that's kind of what I've done there. And what am I doing with this grain delay? I forget what I'm doing there. Oh, that's for um, like a build-up or something later on in right. the track. Um, the kick, um, I don't have any effects on because it's a kick that I designed myself um, just by layering a few other kicks and compressing and EQing things. Um, but how did I get them to match up? Well, the thing is the kick is, doesn't really have much character. It's just a kick. So 
um, unless you're riding Gabba or something. <laughs> a, a kick is a kick, in my yeah. opinion, uh, as long as it's big and punchy. Some people like to tune their kicks to the, the key of their songs and stuff. Um, but this is just a kick that I actually used for quite a number of tunes. And just by changing the snare, you change the whole feel of the of the um, the two together, you know? Right. But this isn't really where the feel of the drums come from. The kicks and snares are just just kicks and snares. What the real action happens um, in the in the percussion section, which is all this stuff down here um, in the breaks group that I've I've called breaks group. And these are all the little all the little tings and tongs, and there's even a little guy in there going. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's a little ting and a tongue. Was it you? No, it's 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 in this sample actually. Uh, I I like to take a lot of samples from uh, just random um, '70s funk songs, and I look for samples, drum samples, that have something interesting about them, some character. Like it's not just some guy in a drum room drumming, right? There's like some crowd noise or just uh, some strange sound. I actually have sampled um, off of YouTube before. I saw this video of this dad um, drumming on his on his little toddler's back, and the toddler starts laughing, and uh, so he's hitting his kid on the back like lightly and and the bum, and uh, the kid is like laughing and stuff, and it's the craziest sound. So I sampled it and like layered it into my drums. Um, I can't remember if I did it with this track. Might not have done it with this one, but it's definitely something I've done in the past. Nice, that's cool. <laughs> so just being creative and using whatever sounds are available to you. Yeah, something that's interesting, you know, something that has character that you can sprinkle a little bit of into into your drums. Obviously, if the kid was laughing and whatever over the whole track, it would be too much. But um, this is the drums in, it, in its entirety. And what I tend to do is, is come up with a, a loop um, with the percussion and then as I design the bass and feel like the bass needs room, I'll, I'll just chop pieces out of the percussion because the, the drums, I mean the, the bass kind of gives um, a rhythmic element as well, especially in glitch hop. So if we, yeah. sol if we solo the bass with that. There's nothing here. There's actually no um, percussion in this section. Just a snare and a hat. And then I bring the percussion back in for the end of the phrase there. So Awesome. So I guess, yeah, to answer your question, just the character comes from the percussion more so than the, the kicks and snares. Excellent. <clears throat> cool. So is there anything else about this track that you feel is worth pointing out? When I... I guess I'll just talk quickly about how I wrote this song because I know you asked me how I typically write songs, but what I started with before I came up with this whole song um, was actually this chord progression down here. Let me just turn. It might be a bit quiet, but... This is actually the loop that I started with. And that was um, the beginning of the song. I thought that was going to be the drop, the big drop or whatever, but um, that didn't end up happening. I ended up just using that as the intro. Um, but I just expanded off of that chord progression and tried to write a different chord progression. And once I came up with that melody, then I felt really a lot of freedom with the chord progression. Yeah. Because I could do anything, so... Um, you know, the, the thing that carries the song along is that hook and it doesn't matter what you do with the chords. So I think that's where I started on, on this track and then just come up with the rest of it. Well, it's an amazing track. I love it. And anyone Cheers, that man. hasn't um, heard it yet or heard the full song or even heard the album, then definitely go and check that out. Where should they go to check out your album, Evan? Um, just soundcloud.com slash slink, S-L-Y-N-K. Yeah. And make sure that you follow him there as well, because his music is amazing. 
Yeah, I'm so, on Facebook as well. Facebook.com slash Evan Slink, E V A N S L Y N K. There'll be like links in the description or something, yeah? Yeah, there'll be links yeah. to that stuff. Sweet. And are you on Twitter as well? Um, I am on Twitter, sort of. <laughs> right. You can follow okay. me if you want. I just, I don't do a lot on Twitter. I'm on everything, you know? It's part of my job. <laughs> yeah. To be on everything. And definitely one thing that you guys should check out is his YouTube channel. There's a lot of great tutorials on there and fun stuff and great music so that's yeah another place to check him out so one last thing i wanted to ask you about evan is uh what's what's all this rumors i hear about this course that you've been making for base gorilla <laughs> what's going on the rumors are true luke omg you of all people should know this <laughs> <laughs> i've been kept in the dark yeah so um yes luke um i have recorded a uh a very long tutorial series um, there's 20 videos. Each video goes for 20 minutes. And the tutorial series is me writing a song from start to finish. I start with a blank project um, with nothing and then finish the tutorial with a full song uh, rendered out and ready to send to, to labels or put on your SoundCloud or whatever. Um, a full, I don't know how long the song is, four minutes or something. So, and it's an amazing song. It is a... Uh very powerful really glitchy funky track so really worth checking out yeah um and all the all the sounds in the in the bass line and everything like that i i show you how to create from scratch in serum and massive and then we eq everything we uh, make the drums and and program the chords and lay out the arrangement and yeah it's a lot of fun it was interesting actually starting the tutorial series because I'm sitting down saying, okay, here we are writing a whole song from start to finish. And I'm inside my head, I'm, I have no idea what I'm about to write. Um, but it's, you know, that's kind of where the project went and how the song turned out. So I think it turned out pretty good. Yeah, it did. It just sounds amazing. So but, if you guys want to keep updated on that, then uh, we'll put a link in the description where you can get updates and listen to the track once we're ready to go with it. It should be coming out end of this month or towards the end of this month at some point. Late, late February? Yeah, I would say late February. Yeah, yeah it's going to be fun. Can't wait for you guys to see it. Excellent. Well, we really hope that you enjoyed getting down with Slink today, everyone. And we hope that his advice has made you think. And don't forget to click on the hyperlink to join the early bird course list on the course and also make sure that you follow slink on youtube soundcloud facebook twitter everywhere that's right so, yeah i just want to say thanks a lot for sharing all that great knowledge with us today no and uh, we're really looking forward to hearing what you come out with do you have any uh, releases lined up for like soon this year or i have i have a five track ep that i'm planning on releasing um, around the same time that we released the the, the um, tutorial series at the end of awesome. February. Um, and uh, that's already done and ready to go. And I'm also working on another kind of disco funk um, talk box kind of inspired EP with Father Funk on the guitars. So um, I probably shouldn't talk too much about that one, but since we're still writing it, but... Uh, that should be coming out whenever we finish it, basically. <laughs> Excellent. And what's the name of the EP, the five-track EP that's coming out soon? Uh, that would be called The Delighted People. Awesome. So look out for that, everybody. And um, thanks again, Evan. It's been great speaking to you today. And thanks a lot for you sharing too. all that great advice. No worries. Catch you next time. All right. Peace. Peace. <laughs>